writers around the world. It's your Aussie writing mentor Jim Parsons and this is lesson eight. Now I said last week that I'd introduce you to duck. This is duck, the most faithful duck anyone could ever hope for. Shoulder duck, look at that. My supervisor looks over my shoulder all the time. Covered duck. Oh okay, all right, all right, I'm sorry. Lesson eight. Another really important one, I want to talk about the opening chapter. It's, it's an absolutely crucial part of your book. Why? Because just as with a job interview or an introduction to someone, the old adage comes into play. You don't get a second chance to make a good first impression. You've got to be firing on all cylinders in that opening chapter. It's got to impress. Let's think about the bookshop experience. Now, I know online bookstores are much more prevalent these days, but the, the devoted reader still loves the smell, loves to wander a good bookshop. What's the book choosing experience? The cover catches the eye, perhaps. You think, oh, I wonder what that's about. You look at the blurb on the back cover. That sounds interesting. And if you've got time, what do you do next? You open it up and you read at least the first page. So I'm going to say to you, first chapter is important. First page is even more important. And it's possible that your first paragraph, even your first sentence is important. Now, it's not just the book buyer the general public. If you're hoping to be published by a traditional publisher, you're probably sending off your manuscript to the editor at the publishing house or to an agent. Now, these people are A, very busy, and B, looking for books that will make them money. They are not charitable institutes. They're not there to say, ah, oh, she's new on the block, give her a go. No way in the world. If that book that manuscript doesn't look as though it's going to make them a million dollars. It's going to go in the slush pile. Now, don't think that the publisher or the agent is going to wait to pay until page 50 or wait for chapter 10 to find out there's something really good goes on in this book. No, they need to know immediately. So I'm going to suggest to you today that your opening chapter needs to do three things. One, you should already be familiar with from this course to date, and that is to introduce your central character, your protagonist, in the status quo. Let us see this character. But let us see this character in a way that grabs us, that makes us care about them. Now, OK, if it's a murderer about to commit a crime, your heart's not going to go out to them, but you need to care what it's all about, whether they're going to succeed, whether they're going to get caught. You don't have to love them to bits, right? You have to care about this character. So the character has to be sufficiently well drawn to grab your attention. So number one, you're establishing your character. It's no good having six people running around for the first chapter with no one understanding who they're really meant to follow. I gave you scenarios before where the entire army was the first character. No, it can't work that way. The second task of your opening chapter is to establish the tone. Now, this is a curious word, but it's very closely related to tone of voice. And tone of voice is something I'm sure you're familiar with. You can tell if I'm being angry or sarcastic, you can tell whether I'm happy from my tone of voice. You can tell whether I'm serious or gloomy. Yes. And of course, one of the most uh, important aspects of tone to establish early for your reader is if you like to write wittily and use satire. Now, satire, these days, a lot of people make the mistake of calling it all types of satire sarcasm. Sarcasm is a nasty, barbed, bitter attack on a particular person. Satire is a more, uh, is a softer, a softer form of humour directed more often at society or at groups. And it can make 
reading very enjoyable. One of the most famous, or probably the most famous, examples of this is the opening lines of Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, often quoted. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Okay, good fun. So if you're into writing wittily, make sure that this comes across quickly to your reader so that they understand you're speaking tongue in cheek very often throughout your book and that you're not to be taken too seriously. But setting the tone of the book so that the reader knows what to expect. If you start off all bright and breezy and funny and then the book deteriorates into something that's, that's quite grim, you're misleading your reader. So that's the second point. The third point is the one that I'm going to devote the most attention to today and I've hinted at it. And that is your opening, your first chapter, even your opening paragraph, certainly your first page, has to hook the reader. It's an expression everybody understands, right? A fishing expression there. You've got to hook the reader. Make sure they know this is going to be the sort of book they want to read. Now, clearly, your hook has to suggest what the the rest of the book is like. It's no good opening with absolutely laugh a minute slapstick humour and then having none of it in the rest of the book. It's no good starting with high excitement and then writing a boring book thereafter. Okay, so the hook on the first page, first chapter, is extremely important. And I'm going to talk about various ways of hooking the reader. What is the bait that we can use? So that's all in Lesson 8. Let's quickly run through those three tasks of an opening chapter again. The first one is to introduce the central character in the status quo, somehow make the reader care about that character, care enough to read on. The second, the second point is to indicate the tone of the book, and I've added here genre. It's not a bad idea. Can the reader be certain whether they're reading a fantasy or an historical romance? That's something you should show them in the first chapter. And can the reader expect a good laugh or a good cry? The third thing is, of course, hook the reader. Use a variety of devices to hook the reader, even in the first paragraph or very first sentence. Now, let's go through these. Number one, I think I've dealt with this sufficiently last week. Last, I suggest if you don't understand this idea, you need to go back and have a look at that lesson. I will talk a little bit about genre and tone of the book, however. And I've got a couple of examples here to offer you. This is a passage from my book, Aunt Harriet's Legacy. And while it certainly isn't the opening chapter, it's just a passage, let's pretend that it's in chapter one and see what emerges. Can you pick up what genre this might be? And can you pick up the tone? Is it light-hearted? Is it tongue-in-cheek? Is it serious? What? Here we go. Grandpapa strode to the hat rack in the hall and waited for Papa to join him. Mama had just risen and was standing at the top of the stair. Before Papa could swing the door open, Mama cried out, Wait, John! Her voice was so hoarse and strained that we all turned to stare. She slowly descended the staircase with my baby brother in her arms. The lanky three-year-old was still called Baby John. Her eyes were fixed on the boy's face so that she felt blindly for each step. What is it, my dear? Papa said. Mama's face was set in a mask of grief, her mouth strained tight. He rushed to her. Mama thrust the child into his arms as her legs collapsed and she sat abruptly on the bottom stair. He did not wake. Papa touched the child's face. Quite cold. He died in the night then. At that, Mama threw back her head and howled hideously. Mrs. Milton and Charlotte rushed into the kitchen doorway and instinctively took up the same horrible key. Well, I hope you didn't think it was laugh a minute. 
because it's meant to be quite tragic and you should have that sense of gloom in that passage. And there should be enough clues in there with all the mamas and papas and a sense that this is a period piece. It's set in the 19th century. Okay, let's compare that with another passage, this time from a work in progress called Vonnie and Claude. Even the name, might, which suggests Bonnie and Clyde, might suggest that this is a bit of a spoof. And this is close to is Vonnie Hubble, who's the beginning, but not the way the book starts. The character is an elderly woman. She's a great fan of Miss Marple in the mystery stories of Agatha Christie. And so her great desire is to be like Miss Marple and solve crimes. So here we have a description of her. Her excursions, weekly treats at senior concession rates, were simply extensions of her neighbourhood watch duties. She was vigilant in her own street, making two circuits each day, rain, hail or shine, and always careful to vary the times so that thieves could not predict her movement. At the introductory neighbourhood watch meeting, she had shaken her head in wonder to hear the crime prevention officer voice her very words, Be observant. After the meeting, when everyone was enjoying a cup of tea, she had shown Constable Barster her notebook and he had been struck dumb with admiration at the notes she had made right there in the meeting. Constable Thomas Barlow, clearly overworked and rushed off his feet, dried egg on shirt front from hurried breakfast, trouser fly undone. Constable Barlow became her contact person. He had thoughtfully distributed his card at the meeting. And even when there were no signs of disturbance, she would always phone in an all's well report to him Monday morning as regular as clockwork. He was often unavailable, increasingly so as his workload mounted. Then one morning someone at the station told her he had asked for a transfer to Mount Isa. She sent a farewell card, care of the Mount Isa police station, saying, Mount Isa is very fortunate indeed. A sad loss to Brisbane. Thank you for everything, your neighbourhood watch friend, Veronica Hubble. Be observant. Well, I hope there you can see it's extremely tongue-in-cheek. We're not meant to take this seriously. It's sending up Veronica and making her seem rather silly. All right. So those two passages are extremely different. And as a reader picking up either of those books, you should get some sense of what they're all about. And of course, the last one, Hook the Reader. Let's deal with that right now. OK, as I said, I'm going to devote a lot of time to the opening chapter, the opening paragraph, especially. Are you ready to make a good first impression on your reader? In this section, I'm going to look hard at, at how you can hook your reader. It's a fishing analogy, so what bait are we going to use? I'll suggest to you there are two important types of bait. One is action, the other is suspense. Let's take action first. There's a Latin expression or a Latin term that many of you will have heard, in medias res. It's a good one to learn because the next time you're having coffee with your friends, you can say, I've started my new book. I've started in media res. There's always a chance one of your friends, the dumb one, will say, that's a funny title for a book. And you can just say, no, no, no. It's a Latin expression meaning in the middle of the action. I've started in the middle of the, the action. And it's important that you do that. So let's talk about action. What springs to mind? Movies, action movies, forget it. The literary meaning of action is not explosions, cars rolling over, gunfire, wild chases. No. Think more in terms, if you want to talk movies, think more in terms of those scenes I'm sure you've seen of movie making where the director says, the lights, camera, action. It's that action. Because what happens then? No, it's not an explosion. Very often, it's simply the main character stepping out of a doorway and walking across the street. Or it might be two people put their heads together and start talking over a table in a, in a restaurant. That's action. It's action as an opening in total opposition to a static 
opening. Your book needs an active opening rather than a static one. So what's a static opening? If you spend three pages, even a page, describing the history and style of the village in which your story is set, or if you give six generations of the tribe that your fantasy story is all about, that's a static opening. Nothing's happening. You're just talking. If overall your story is about a jealous lover and you spend several pages talking about jealousy and how damaging it can be, a treatise on jealousy, that's a static opening. Right? Now, I'm sure you can point to plenty of books that do open like this. You can open any Charles Dickens novel and say, look, look, he did it. Yes, in the 19th century. These days, people are living in a faster world and they want action quickly. As well as that, some best-selling authors, once they have acquired quite a large fan base, they can get away with anything. They can start as slowly as they like if they choose, because they know their readers are going to wait. And their readers know if they wait long enough, this guy or this lady can really deliver a good story. But you, if I may be so bold, do not have that luxury. You are not a famous author. So you have to make a good impression. You have to give your potential reader a chance to say, oh, this could be good. So we're starting with action in medias res, any action. Just get that character out there. If you've got your character sitting on the side of a river, tossing pebbles in and thinking dark thoughts about his parents or his lover, that's action. And people will be intrigued. So start with action. Start with a conversation. Best action of all. Very hard to resist good dialogue. A good opening line of dialogue. What a wonderful way to start a story. Now, what was the second element? Suspense. And again, I want you to turn your back on the movie idea of suspense. This doesn't have to be the character hovering on the edge of the cliff, wondering whether to jump. It doesn't have to be someone standing there with a gun pointed at the main character. Not that sort of suspense. It can be anything. Here's a definition of suspense. This is a literary definition of suspense. Suspense is any unanswered question that the reader would like answered. So if you show on page one that your character is wearing a red sock and a blue sock, and this is interesting enough for you to turn the page to find out why the heck this character is wearing very odd socks, then that's suspense. Please keep that in mind. You can fill your first page with several hooks, several little snippets of suspense that will make your reader want to turn the page and find out the answer. It's an unanswered question. And it's not necessarily a question you pose. It's a question that pops into your reader's mind. So if you drop a vague hint on page one that your central character really hates men, the reader thinks there must be a reason for that. I wonder what has happened in this person's life that she really hates men. And so they will perhaps want to read on just to establish that. Now, if your character says they hate men, and as well, they're wearing one red sock and one blue sock. Whoa, you've got a winner there. <laughs> okay, so there are the two main things. Start with action and make sure there are several elements of suspense. In other words, hooks to catch the reader. <music>
get inside the main character's head and show his or her feelings. Let's look at those with a little more depth. Introduce a unique character or voice. Now, I'm not going to try and do a Huck Finn voice. You can read that. You can recognise straight away, if you know the adventures of Tom Sawyer, that this is the opening um, paragraph of that book. And straight away, there's humour. The character leaps off the page because of that unique voice. You can also start with a journey. Now, there are lots of journeys, and I, I threw this one in because... It's a man just walking away. The hundred-year-old man who climbed out the window and disappeared by Jonas Jonasson. Instead of attending his hundredth birthday party, Alan Carlson decides to go on an adventure. And he climbs out the window of his nursing home and shuffles off. That's a journey. And it can be a mental journey, a spiritual journey. Don't overlook these things. Use foreshadowing, and this is this is a beauty, and the one that you're more likely to be able to incorporate in practically any book. And here's a few samples. Life was certainly strange, Benson thought. When he had left home for work at 8am, the thought of murdering someone was the furthest thing from his mind. The dam above the town got a mention every few years in the local paper. Cracks reported and fixed. Disaster committees formed or disbanded, but most of the reports were about the size and quality of the fish the local fishing club caught there. Okay, there's a sense of foreboding there. You think to yourself, why are they mentioning cracks in the dam wall? And the last one, the man was still there when she came out of the hairdresser. It's meant to be he. He hastily folded his paper and made her a nearby car as she walked to her own. So, a little sense of threat there. Compelling dialogue. Kicking off with dialogue is good at the best of times, but something that's got a bite to it is even better. Why did I marry him? Small down girl, slick city guy. You know how it is, Ali. If I knew how it was, I wouldn't have asked. Everyone else found him creepy, ran a mile, but my best friend ends up with him. Marco snapped the briefcase closed. Find out where he's hiding and kill him. Marco, this is my brother we're talking about. Do I have to get rid of you both? He held out the briefcase. Pistol's in there. Ditch it in the river when you're done. That's pretty compelling, Tyler. Introduce danger or conflict. Well, as you can see, it can be incorporated in dialogue. It can be incorporated in all sorts of other things and here's a couple more examples of that didn't you think about the problems it would cause for the family david give me a break you've never given a thought to mum and us kids until now anyway so there's conflict in the very first lines the two cops got out and walked back towards his vehicle one had his gun leveled get out slow and keep your hands high his mother had told him it was not the night to go driving around town. And he'd said, I got a right. So we have both danger and some sort of a, a moral and mental conflict here as well. Promise the reader a change from his or her ordinary everyday life. This is so important. It's one of the chief reasons we read. We, uh, we call reading escapism, escaping. And what are we escaping to? often danger and threats and all manner of things, the change from ordinary life can be in the setting. Suddenly we can be in Paris or New York City, in a fantasy world, an ancient world, out back Australia or the frozen north. They are places we could never go in our normal lives, may not even want to go, but we can experience that vicariously through a novel. And the other change from ordinary life that is absolutely fascinating in books, and that is to experience someone else's occupation or workplace. Now, if it's not something you've had personal experience of as a writer, you've got to do your research very thoroughly if you want to convince the reader and get it right and not have people falling about laughing. For example, if you're going to show life inside the cockpit of a jumbo jet, you've either got to have been a pilot or else you've got to know your stuff. Same with a submarine. 
we have a morbid fascination with death I think at times and, and so being allowed a peek inside a morgue or inside a forensic lab when they're dissecting a body or even dissecting a living body on an operating theatre table these are all things that can grab us and of course those, uh, those worlds that seem so glamorous like being on the movie set as well there are ways of transporting your reader if you can do it but don't forget the humble things I'd be just as interested to find out what it's like to be a night packer at Walmart or a security guard somewhere. Ordinary jobs can also be interesting if you don't do them yourself. You can also get inside the main character's head and show his or her feelings. I won't give you actual examples of this, but let's just talk about it. Hearing a character's thoughts establishes greater intimacy and immediacy and it can build empathy and caring quite quickly in the reader. So a valuable thing to incorporate into your opening chapter. And getting inside a character's head is what we know as POV, point of view. It's an important element of show, don't tell. I mean, if you're inside living the character's life, that's showing, isn't it? It's not telling anything. Now, I'm skipping over this because it's just so important I'm going to be dealing with it in very great depth in later lessons, several lessons. But suffice to say for the moment that POV, getting inside the character's head, is very easy to do in first person, but it can be just as easily and effectively used in third person, and many people overlook that. So let's say we need a hook in the very first line. Most useful place. Here's a few first lines that should work as hooks. Alice had never killed anyone before. Yeah, now I want to read on. The listening device the FBI had taped to his chest pulled at the skin and seemed to shout out its presence. We know something big's about to go on here. Alan was late coming home and that meant he would be drunk and that meant trouble for her. So here we've got someone's thoughts, obviously a female, and there's a dangerous situation emerging. Again, the last one has that sense of impending danger. The shark's motion was leisurely and graceful, but Bart knew its streamlined body was a projectile waiting to be fired. Presumably, Bart is in the water with the shark. And I'm just going to finish up by saying, follow up. Don't just be satisfied with one hook. You have an entire chapter to work with, Start with a solid hook. Use a first line or a first sentence to get a good solid hook in there. Follow up with a variety of hooks. You've got your whole chapter to do this. They don't have to be one after the other. Spread them out. Choose from some of those that I've listed. Some good dialogue, good POV, interesting setting, conflict, interesting character or voice. You can use a combination of those, I'm sure. And get in a punchline. Make the closing sentence of the chapter a page turner, because that's the best place to have a page turner, right at the end of the chapter. Don't let the reader go to sleep or put the book down. So, what's your exercise this week? I think it's pretty obvious. Write your opening chapter. And this is such an important aspect of your book that I'm going to make it yet another writing contest. You have one month. You have until midnight, the 31st of July, to get an entry in. Your opening chapter, please, not a super long one. I don't want to have to wade through 4,000, 5,000 words. Try and keep it to under 2,000 if you can. Brevity will not be detrimental. I'm going to judge it on all the things I've talked about today. Have you hooked me? If you can hook me with your first chapter, you're the winner. And the prize will be mentoring with me full time from start to finish. The whole mentoring process for every chapter. It's worth hundreds of dollars. So please get an entry in. This is a great opportunity for you to get mentoring help for a book that I think might turn out pretty good. If I've decided that the opening chapter's good, there's every chance the whole book is going to be good. So I'll finish with my email address so that you can jot that down and send in your entry. 
And until we meet next week, goodbye, keep safe.